This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome members of our military who are joining us on the Internet, and a special welcome to listeners in the Portland area who are tuning in on KXL. Our guest today has been called the most prominent First Amendment lawyer in the country, Mr. Floyd Abrams. From the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times and Judith Miller's CIA grand jury case to the New York Museum of Art's right to host an exhibition which some found offensive, Abrams has forced us to come to terms with our conflicting attitudes toward free speech. Before he joins us, I want to mention that Mr. Abrams studied at Cornell University and received his law degree from Yale. And immediately following law school, he clerked for Judge Paul Leahy in Delaware. And the rest is a matter of public record. As I mentioned, Abrams worked on the Pentagon Papers case, as well as defending Al Franken from Fox News, tobacco companies from government-mandated warning labels, and defended corporations and unions' rights to speak publicly about politics in the Citizens United case. You don't have to look too far before you find a case that Abrams has argued with which you vehemently agree or disagree. And this is what makes him a legend in the legal community. Above all things, Abrams is an equal opportunity defender of the First Amendment. Politics, discomfort, even the fear of opening the door to terrorists aside, Abrams is driven by one principle, the equal and consistent application of the Constitution to all citizens. And it's because of his unwavering commitment to principle that he is one of the most awarded attorneys in American history, from the William J. Brennan Award and Thurgood Marshall Award to the Milton S. School Award for Outstanding Appellate Advocacy. Uh, we would need another hour of programming to do justice to Mr. Abrams' distinguished service. Mr. Abrams is presently a partner at Cahill Gordon Rindell. And I want to add that in addition to authoring historically significant briefs and reviews, he's published two books. The first is titled Speaking Freely, and his most recent book is Friend of the Court on the Front lines of the First Amendment. It's my privilege to welcome to the program our nation's most knowledgeable First Amendment lawyer, Mr. Floyd Abrams. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Abrams. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's good to be on. Now, we're going to get to some other specific cases in just a moment, but before we do, I want to ask you to weigh in on the recent surveillance of AP reporters and now pretty much anyone who owns a cell phone. This looks to have come straight from the White House. And though I'm no lawyer, I'd like to try to understand why anyone would ever need a warrant to wiretap anymore. <laughs> well, you're, you're asking the right questions. Uh, I guess wiretapping as such is a little bit, a little bit different because, uh, after all, what, what we are talking about in the AP case uh, uh, is the records of phone calls. You know, who, who called who, when, for how long, uh, not a tape of what was said. Now, my view is uh, that uh, notwithstanding that wiretapping is worse than having the telephone records, uh, the, the notion that telephone records are, are, you know, to be easily available by just serving a subpoena on the telephone company uh, in, instead of abiding by the Justice Department's guidelines and going to the journalistic organization and either trying to work things out or effectively going to court one or the other side and having a judge decide is is very troubling. I mean, I, I found the, the, the whole AP situation very disturbing from a, any sort of First Amendment perspective and the situation with the, with the Fox reporter, James Rosen. Uh, if anything, maybe even more disturbing you know, because there the administration sought a search warrant uh, in the course of a leak investigation but did so on the basis of representations to a court that a journalist was, in effect, uh, a violator, a co-conspirator under the espionage law, a criminal, uh, simply because the journalist had asked a lot of questions of someone with access to classified information, had persuaded him to give the information, had flattered him, or as the Justice Department put it, appealed to his ego. I mean, they, they really went very far down the line, I would say over the line, to making uh, journalism 
uh, almost a per se crime. So if all you have to say is that you need to do something in the name of national security, doesn't that pretty much put every right protected by the Constitution in jeopardy? I mean, isn't this it becoming does. the, the, the end-all yeah. excuse yeah. For, yeah. for bad behavior? Right. That's true. And, and, but that's why this uh, almost explosion of public debate about this, whether it was the AP case or the Fox one or now the, the NSA one, is really a very good thing. Because uh, I really think that this sort of discussion, our discussion, the, the national discussion about this, has a real chance of impacting behavior. You know, lots of times people talk about things, and, you know, they, they can't do anything about them. But I don't think the administration wants this fight, and I'm hopeful that they'll learn from it. So, so what happens to someone like Snowden, the whistleblower who leaked the NSA documents to The Guardian, and he's now revealing that he has documents showing U.S. surveillance on the Chinese? Well, what happens to him? Is he a Daniel Ellsberg type of whistleblower who is bringing uh, incorrect behavior to the attention of the American people? Or is he a security risk? Wh which is he? Well, um it almost depends on your uh, political, cultural uh, views of, of, of society. I, uh, my current reaction, you know, subject to learning more about facts as, as the days go on, I think the revelation uh, of the NSA program, which, which included uh, the uh, obtaining of telephone records of Americans who had done nothing wrong, who were suspected of doing nothing wrong, and, and the inclusion of that in databases uh, by the NSA uh, served the public considerably. It's very hard to assess if there's real national security harm because of it, but I can assess that there's a real benefit to it in, in letting the American public know. Uh, I have a somewhat different view about, uh, you know, the, the same subject, the same topic with respect to revelations about uh, essentially spying on places like China or the like. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I think there's a, a more obvious national security issue. Uh, and, uh, and as a legal matter, apart from what I think, uh, I think that... Uh, 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 once uh, uh, he gets into revelations about American activities abroad vis-a-vis -vis foreign countries, he is certainly at much greater legal risk uh, if he's ever uh, brought back to the U.S. So this is very interesting because apparently, uh, he, if rumor has it, that he's in China right now. And by uh, revealing this information, he hopes to have some protection. But in fact, he may be making himself more vulnerable to a uh, criminal charge. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't have any doubt. That, uh, I, I mean, look, we, we, we've got an Espionage Act with two major provisions that bear on this. One relates to misuse of classified information. And that's what Bradley Manning has pled guilty to, uh, and that uh, at the very least he was guilty of. And, and it's hard to see how uh, Mr. Snowden wouldn't, you know, be potentially liable under that. But the one that Manning is now being tried under is one which has a potential death sentence, and that that is uh, using classified information for the purpose of harming the U.S. And and uh, you know when you when you go to China, and if you know depending on what he's doing, but but if you go to China for for safety uh, and give them information about American hacking or whatever. With respect to China, you, you're certainly putting yourself in line for much greater legal risk. Yes, I, I believe that's right. Uh, but, you know, you're not always thinking clearly when you're on the run. We, we have to take Absolutely. a short commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about another challenge to the First Amendment, whistleblowers who cooperate with the media. You're listening to the Costa Report.
This Legal Minute is brought to you by Nolan, Hammerley, Etienne, and Haas. Experienced attorneys providing professional legal services to the Central Coast for 85 years. Hello, this is attorney Stephen Wagner with your Legal Minute. Have you ever said to yourself, there ought to be a law for that? Well, often there is. In today's segment, I will address the issue of distracted driving, and here's my opening salvo. Smartphones make dumb drivers. Of course, I'm talking about all those other drivers. The laws vary from state to state, but there is one common thread. These laws were legislatively put on the books because of the outcry of concern over drivers who are texting, talking, emailing, and tweeting. Distracted driving is nothing new. We used to look at the cows and pastures. Now we take photos with our smartphones. In California, there are over 20 million licensed drivers. 20 million. Here's a scary thought. Just think about how many of those 20 million own and use cell or smartphones. I can't possibly cover all the laws in all the states, but I can say that the trend is to prohibit or sharply curtail some uses of smartphones while driving. Whether this leads to a new species of liability remains to be seen, but one thing is clear. With each new feature and amazing breakthrough in technology comes a new and tempting distraction. As new laws go into effect, it will be interesting to see how this impacts the law of negligence. I predict that these new laws will expand the application of important negligence concepts such as duty, breach, and causation, thereby creating more liability theories. While we marvel at the great advances in technology and the cool things that our smartphones can do, they just keep on getting smarter. But do we? This is Stephen Wagner, and that's your Legal Minute. Brought to you by Nolan, Hammerley, Etienne, and Haas. Selected in 2013 as one of the top law firms in the United States, Martinsville Hubble. When the going gets tough, you need to call Aldolfo Garcia. Recently, we needed some work done here at the radio station. We called Community Tree Service. That's Adolfo Garcia's company. He showed up immediately from the phone call. We said what we wanted done, which was a huge amount of work done. He and his staff were here at 8 o'clock the next morning. They followed all safety procedures. Community Tree Service are fully insured, and I was very impressed at the way they cleaned up the area after they'd finished working and clearing a huge amount of brush and trees. I love, love, love Community Tree Service. Adolfo Garcia is the owner of a local business. You can reach them at communitytreeservice.net. You can reach them at 763-2391. If you've got a job to do, when the going gets tough, Community Tree Service gets going. I love this company. There's a reason our sales are way up at North Bay Ford here in Santa Cruz. Put simply, we've got the best deals on the best vehicles. Hello, I'm Bobby Robinson. North Bay Ford is your locally owned dealership with low overhead, friendly, small town values, and great deals on new cars, trucks, and RVs. Get this, Bobby's Deal of the Week at North Bay Ford. You've seen the television commercials. Motor Trend Magazine asked people who were driving Hondas and Toyotas to take the Ford EcoBoost Challenge, and they did and found the Ford models with EcoBoost technology to be more fun to drive with more power and better mileage than their own cars. But why believe the commercials when you can take the Ford EcoBoost Challenge yourself at North Bay Ford? When you need an economical focus for your college student, a new Explorer for Sunday drives, or a fleet of powerful F-350s for your Berry Ranch, look first to your friends and neighbors at locally owned North Bay Ford, 1999 Soquel Avenue, Santa Cruz, or on the web at NorthBayFord.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is legal legend Mr. Floyd Abrams. And before the break, you were making the point that Snowden's release of information which revealed surveillance which was being performed on U.S. citizens is uh, a dramatically different situation from sharing classified information about surveillance on the Chinese. So moving along here, we've learned that the government conducted surveillance on the activity of reporters, which basically means that they can trace the source of any story. So that pretty much destroys any anonymity. So in my view today, it it would pretty much be impossible for someone like Deep Throat to even exist. Uh, But the problem for whistleblowers goes a little bit deeper than that. Um, when we take a look at a, like the case of uh, PFC 
Bradley Manning, which you mentioned earlier, who pled guilty to releasing documents to WikiLeaks. So I was thinking that maybe you could share with us how is this different, or maybe it's not different, from Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers. Well, there are obviously some similarities, uh, uh, particularly, I think, between Dan Ellsberg uh, and, and uh, Mr. Snowden. Um, uh, certainly the sort of image, you know, a sort of man against the world, you know, a person who is persuaded that even though he agreed to keep certain material secret, that it is so outrageous, uh, and uh, at least in Mr. Ellsberg's view at the time, criminal, that, that, that he had no choice morally but to release the information. Uh, and in that sense, I, I suspect that Mr. Snowden's, you know, had the same uh, view, at least he says he did. Uh, uh, the differences, I think, basically are this. Uh, uh, on the one hand, the, the Pentagon Papers are basically a historical study. I mean, they, they were a study by the Defense Department during the war in Vietnam of how we got into the war. Uh, the, the, the study ended in 1968. The New York Times ob obtained it. Uh, from Mr. Ellsberg in 1971, so it was already three years dated, uh, and and there wasn't much in it that uh, I think could fairly be called even potentially threatening uh, to national security. Uh, maybe a few things, and indeed the Times chose not to publish a number of uh, parts of the Pentagon Papers. Mm -hmm. What, what Snowden has released are ongoing activities. Uh, it makes it more newsworthy. Uh, there's no doubt of that. I mean, I think these revelations are more newsworthy than the Pentagon Papers. Uh, the fact that, uh, you know, we, we, we're doing all these things. In uh, real time. We're doing them now. Right now, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, uh, you know, when you get to talking about uh, U.S. hacking in China, you may be doing uh, a lot more harm, at least potentially so, and I'll bet the government thinks so, than, than reporting in a way that sort of embarrasses the NSA about what it's doing vis-a-vis -vis Americans. So, you know, there, there are similarities. Uh, now, what about uh, PFC Bradley Manning? for example, and, well, and WikiLeaks. Matt, is there a different right. intention there? And does that somehow color whether the intention was uh, based right. on a moral um, mandate? Yeah, uh, I don't know what, what I'll call them private Manning's uh, intention was. And, and that's, that's a central issue in his ongoing case. I mean, he says it was just that to expose wrongdoing. Uh, the, the government... Uh, has a darker view of uh, of what it is, and and some journalists have written things you know much more critical of him than simply characterizing him as an idealist. I think we'll find out a lot about that during uh, the uh, the trial itself. But uh, look, all three of them, uh, on the face of it, uh, owed certain obligations to the government. All had promised in one way or another. And, and generally in writing, but, but in writing or not, they wouldn't release information, and all of them did. What Manning did that's different is an almost a promiscuous release, you know, hundreds of thousands of pages of materials and WikiLeaks, for example. So it's the volume that troubles you. It, it wasn't based... Well, that's, that's one of the it, things. I, I mean, it, it's, it troubles me in the sense that, for example, when WikiLeaks uh, released uh, 77,000 military reports written by American soldiers in Afghanistan, and a journalist said, how many of them have you read? And Mr. Assange said 2,000 or so. The journalist said, how can you release the other 75,000? And the answer was, well, there's no reason to think that they threaten national security. Well, that may be. Well, it's just not a journalistic act to to just issue, you know, re release hordes of, of papers be because you have them, because they're secret. In my view, it is not a reason to release material that are secret because they are secret. Uh, if they show something wrong or terribly newsworthy, uh, that's something else. Now, it's a legal matter. Uh, you know, it's all it's all something else. Uh, uh, 
I don't think that, that there's any difference in terms of WikiLeaks status uh, than that of, of any newspaper. That's right. WikiLeaks any... is the New York Times only on, uh, on well, the Internet. I'd, I'd, I'd put it in a different way. I, I don't view them, as I've indicated, as terribly journalistic in nature, but I don't think that matters, e even if one simply views them as political activists. You know, who to whom documents were provided. You know, we we provide First Amendment protection not just to the press, but but to people who are engaged in trying to persuade other people to come around to their views. Uh, and and so I, I think WikiLeaks is is if it ever winds up in court in the U.S. You know, is likely to have just about the same First Amendment argument. Whatever you, whatever you think of WikiLeaks, however you characterize them, I and I've been critical of them on grounds that, that I thought they were reckless sometimes in what they released. But you know, that's that, that's a personal, what political, journalistic, whatever view. That, that that's that's not supposed to bear on the law. I think WikiLeaks will and should get get uh, First Amendment protection to the same degree as other organizations would get. Well, I think all news, yeah, and all news outlets are going to have to set their own uh, standards for censorship. I agree. I agree. Right? They're all no, going to I, have I, to decide I, that. They, I, WikiLeaks I, happens I to not have a very high bar right. for what they're going right. to not and, release and, into the public. Yeah. And, and one of the things I was uh, writing about in my book was uh, on WikiLeaks was not uh, so much a legal assessment, but you know my my own uh, personal uh, ass assessment. I I didn't think Mr. Assange ought to be viewed as a hero, and I thought too many of my liberal friends were viewing him that way. That has nothing to do with what sort of legal protection uh, he or or it. Uh, ought to receive if 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 there's ever a legal uh, proceeding commenced, and one of the problems here is that with respect to all of them, everything we talked about so far, we're operating under an Espionage Act passed in 1918, which is phrased extremely broadly. I mean, so broadly that that no one could, uh, in a sense interpret it to mean exactly what it says because it's gone the face of it it would seem to make illegal any reporting about national defense at all yes you know yes. I mean, it's just it's, it's, pr just, it's pretty it's, broad based and uh that's that's true. my problem is is that when yeah. it's that broad based you can really paint anything with that brush now Absolutely. we have to take another break and when we come back we'll find out if there is a pattern of government overreach emerging you're listening to the costa report If you're anything like me, you're scratching your head and wondering what in the world is going on. We have plenty of technology and more resources and knowledge than at any other time in human history. But we just don't seem to be able to solve our problems anymore. They just get bigger and bigger. What's worse is we know what's going to happen if we continue down this path. And it isn't pretty. So that's why I'm asking you, nope. I'm pleading with you to take a moment to read the watchman's rattle, because when you do, you'll be able to spot the five impediments which stand in the way of solving our greatest threats. You'll also discover what you can do about them. Go to RebeccaCosta.com or your favorite bookstore and grab a copy of the watchman's rattle. Don't wait. If you care one iota about what's happening to the life you love, you owe it to yourself to read the watchman's rattle. It may have taken seven years to write, but you can order it in under a minute. It is raucous. It is fun. So get up and go for it. Take the family, take the friends, take the entire neighborhood to the rip-roaring racing fun at Ocean Speedway in Watsonville. Friday night is USAC night number two at Ocean Speedway. That means loud and raucous racing with USAC CRA 410s, four bangers, modifieds, and sport mods. Adults $20, seniors $65 plus $19, kids 6 to 12 $15. Details at OceanSpeedway.com. Ocean Speedway is located at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds, just two miles east of downtown Watsonville on Highway 152. Get up and go for the loud, raucous, rip-roaring racing fun this Friday night at Ocean Speedway.
Hey, it's MZ with 90 for Life update number one. So what am I talking about? What's 90 for Life? Simple, it's the underlying foundation of the longevity company and its product users. The belief that if you give your body all 90 essential nutrients, you will live a longer, healthier life, free of disease and complications from toxic prescription drugs. 90 for Life is a lifestyle marked by taking the longevity Healthy Start Pack faithfully twice a day, seven days a week. One Healthy Start Pack is a month's supply for the average person, and the cost of this pack is $125 including tax. That works out to about $4.17 per day. Pick up your Healthy Start Pack from Dave Michaels here at KSCO Studios weekday afternoons after 1 p.m. or order it online at kscoteam.com or stop by Knox Roofing on El Pueblo in Scotts Valley, the first of several convenient pickup locations for the 90 for Life Healthy Start Pack. We want our KSCO KOMY listeners to be healthy as well as intelligent. Go to kscoteam.com, KSCO Studios after 1 p.m. or Knox Roofing. You and me, we were meant to be. This is us. This is us. They call me Mr. Mom, and I'm here to talk with you Fridays, 7 p.m., about the big challenges of raising families in modern times. Hi, I'm David Marine. What's a parent to do? On Friday, we're talking about Plan B, the morning after pregnancy prevention pill soon to be available for as low as $10 over the counter without a prescription for girls as young as 15. Wow, I have a 14-year-old daughter. Should we tell our daughters it's available? Is Planned Parenthood happy? No, they want all age restrictions removed. Join me and my guest, pediatrician and best-selling author, Dr. Meg Meeker, to sort things out. Mr. Mom, Friday at 7 p.m. on KSCO. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Mr. Floyd Abrams. And before the break, we were talking about the similarities and the differences between Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers case and private Bradley Manning and WikiLeaks, as well as Snowden's recent release of NSA records regarding surveillance on private U.S. citizens as well as specific journalists. Now, apparently Holder and others... Uh, believe that this NSA surveillance order uh, is covered by the provisions in the Patriot Act. And and so for just a moment, if we give them the benefit of the doubt, if that's true, then does that mean the Patriot Act itself is unconstitutional? And, And if that's so, can we pass something that's unconstitutional and violates the provisions of the Constitution? Well, no, we can't do it. Um, the question is, uh, what will the Supreme Court say is constitutional? I mean, there's no doubt that if Section uh, 215 violates the First Amendment or the Fourth Amendment, uh, that it would and should be held unconstitutional. One of the problems, though, is that back in 1979, the Supreme Court issued an opinion which I think was wrong, but but by a 5-3 to three vote, they said that uh, t- as, as regards to telephone records, that there's no reasonable expectation of privacy that someone has in his or, his or her telephone records because you know the telephone company has copies of them. You know it's not in your custody, but their custody. Now, I just think that's wrong, and there were three justices, uh, Justice Stewart, Brennan, and Marshall, who thought it was wrong and, and said... Uh, uh, you know, in a, in a sense, that, look, the world changes. The fact, we, the fact is, we have to use the telephone. We have to use other means of communication, and 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 the fact that they're owned by some entity doesn't mean we therefore have no privacy rights at all. Uh, but that's what the court said then, and that's why I, th- I think the betting right now would be that the court would say that that uh, at least as regards this, this telephonic information. You know, who called who, what, what, what number called what number, at what time, for how long, that that, uh, at least based on that, on that old case, uh, you know, it would seem to be unprotected. Now, hopefully they'll change their mind, but they haven't so far. Now, it's very interesting. I, when I was doing a little research, um, I discovered that when the initial request went out, to obtain uh, these telephone records. There was one head of one telco, one telecommunications company, that refused. Uh, he, yes, was the, I, uh, he was the I head of Quest. Yes. 
And he's in yeah. jail now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they didn't get him for that, but they got him for securities violation. Now, now I want to connect this dot to something you're familiar with, which is Standard & Poor's uh, downrating the credit of the United States, and, right. and Moody's not doing that, and then the government going after Standard & Poor's, which you defended. Uh, we, we seem right. to see a pattern here that's emerging. I, I mean, I, I am the last person to be on the side of conspiracy folks uh, because I, uh, you know, I've, been, I've spent too much time in Washington, D.C., and, and conspiracies really require geniuses, and there aren't enough geniuses to pull off conspiracies. Yeah. But, but there does well, seem to be a little bit of a pattern of overreach, yeah. doesn't there? Yeah. Well, look, I, I'm counsel in one of the in, in those standard and poor cases, so I can't really talk about them too much. Uh, the, you know, so, uh, but they were singled at, out. We can say that. Uh, uh, yes, you can say that. I mean, look, it's true that 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 all the uh, the CDOs, the the particular sophisticated sort of. Uh, 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 the financial instruments that, that that have been named by the government so far had the same rating from Standard and Poor's uh, and Moody's, um, and it's also true that in general, in that time period, they were both in the same ballpark uh, with respect to their ratings, and that Moody's didn't get sued, and Standard and Poor's did, and that Standard and Poor's uh, had downgraded the United States. Now the government says. Uh, one thing had nothing to do with the other. Maybe we'll find out something about that during the, during the course of the, this case, which will be going on. And, uh, and we also have the head of Quest going to jail for securities violations. You know, well, and he was the only holdout. So I, I don't know. I mean, are these related or, or am I connecting the dots in the wrong way? I, I tell you, I I have been so non-conspiratorial <laughs> my my own approaches that I find myself surprised again and again. I, I, I mean, uh, what I, I think of it this way: the events of the last few weeks have uh, vindicated all the people who I thought were paranoid, right? I, I agree. You know, no. these people, I couldn't stand to have dinner with them because they'd go on and on and on uh, yeah. uh, about yeah. how the government was out to get us. And then suddenly we right. find out that the president is apologizing for the IRS, who was yeah. out to get people. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you know, they, so, we, so we had people on the right saying they're really out to get us. They're treating us different. <laughs> and people like me were saying, you know, come on, come on. <laughs> and they were right. And now we have people on the left who've been saying all the time, don't you understand? Uh, the, the NSA knows everything that's going on. <laughs> people like me were saying, oh, well, you know, uh, you're overstating, it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, so, what bothers me it, is it that... A good day for, yeah. It's not a good time to be a moderate or a non-conspiratorial person. That, that's right. It's rough to be a moderate. Uh, yeah. You get hated by both sides. Um, yeah. But, yeah. you know, one of, one of the things that troubled me most about the surveillance is when, uh, you know, or the IRS case, excuse me, when uh, Obama apologized for the IRS's conduct, I, I kind of thought, well, when you come forward and you say things like, we can't protect you unless we have those phone records, wouldn't that be something that you would say before you did that, yeah. not after the yeah. fact? Like, why not go to the American people and say, um, you know, we're going to have to take this measure because otherwise we really can't yes. give protection 100 percent of the time, a as opposed to doing it right. for five and six and seven years, getting caught yeah. and now going after the whistleblowers. Uh, and then I, coming I back and saying we can't protect you in any other way. I, I, I agree with you completely. And by the way, on that, it's both administrations. It's you know, it's President Bush and President Obama. Absolutely. Uh, but 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 uh, no, I, I I couldn't agree more. And 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 I don't I don't accept the proposition that that nothing could have been said about this you know that that it would have ruined everything frustrated all the efforts if if the public had had any idea uh, of what was going on uh, i simply think that the, really an exaggerated articulation uh you know really designed uh to to keep people in the dark so that they could continue this without any public debate about it. And I think the public debate that we're engaged in now on this program and around the country at this time is a very good and long overdue event. 
So one of the things that uh, you bring with you is perspective. Uh, uh, as an individual who has seen many administrations, you point out this isn't you know unique to the Obama administration. You've seen these administrations come and go and these issues come and go. And I would imagine that some administrations and some policies posed a greater danger to civil liberties protected by the Constitution than others. Um, so given that perspective, what do you say to listeners who feel nervous about everything from surveillance, gun control, misuse of the IRS, the persecution of Standard Poor's? You know, they connect all this stuff. What do you say to them? <laughs> uh, look, I would say to them, you still live in the freest country in the world. Uh, you still live in a country which doesn't send out, you know, its police to arrest people at night for their political views. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's not as if the game is over and, and we live in a totalitarian society. We don't. But uh, there are things to be concerned about. Uh, and, 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 you know, you've, you've just got to got to keep up the good fight and 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 for people listening uh you know they've got to be prepared to keep answering uh you know what what i was suggesting earlier half humorously but but you know with people like me who would have denied any of this <laughs> you know a few weeks ago <laughs> just because it seemed so unlikely and and you know and uh, the people who talk like this suddenly can sort of sound like nuts until you know that, that they're really right. <laughs> well, on that note, we have to take our last break, um, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars. Now, everyone knows that my favorite is your Pinot Noir, but Caraccioli's known for a lot more than that. It's really the bubbles that kind of differentiates what we're doing in the area as opposed to a lot of our peers. And the way that we looked at it was there's great Chardonnay and Pinot Noir fruit in the Santa Lucia Highlands in the greater Monterey County. And we wanted to be able to utilize those grapes and showcase them in a little bit different light. And to do that comes a little bit of a laborious process in terms of making sparkling wine and doing A little it. bit? A lot of it, <laughs> but still definitely worth the trouble and worth the wait. Um, we're currently selling 2006 and 2007 sparkling wines in the beginning of 2013. So it kind of tells you the time invested as well as all of the different techniques that we use and Michelle implements to ensure that we're delivering a quality product. Thank you for being with us again, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. What does your website do for you? Does it simplify doing business and automate routine tasks? Does it connect with your target audience and bring new business? If you can't answer yes, then you need to contact Sunstar Media. Located on the Monterey Peninsula for over 17 years, Sunstar Media has developed websites for startups, brick-and-mortar stores, to corporations on the stock market. What makes Sunstar different is the customization that goes into every tailored to each client's unique needs and vision. Sunstar's experienced pros keep you ahead of the game with their custom-fit development process for website applications that cater to your company's specific needs. Learn more at sunstarmedia.com. Mention you heard this ad on the Rebecca Costa Show and get a free web analysis report on your current site or a free web consultation for your next project. Let's discuss how Sunstar can help you. Reach out to us at sunstarmedia.com. Some things were meant to last, like elegant jewelry, fine watches, and unique gifts you can always find at Dell Williams Jewelers in Santa Cruz. Hello, I am Emily Coonerty, along with my daughter, Daisy. Yes. Our family-owned Dell Williams Jewelers has been providing Central Coast residents with beautiful things that last since 1927. Listen to what we have that will last for you right now. For that wonderful dad, select the perfect timepiece with a wide assortment of watches from Rolex, Raymond Wheel, and more. And for that accomplished grad, choose something special to be engraved like an elegant frame, business card case, bookmark, or other silver gift, or a cherished piece of fine jewelry. Gifts that will last a lifetime at Dill Williams Jewelers in Santa. 
Santa Cruz. When you want to find elegant jewelry, a fine watch, or a unique gift that must last, look first at Dell Williams Jewelers on Pacific Avenue in downtown Santa Cruz since 1927 or on the web at dellwilliams.com. When only the finest will do, we are Dell Williams Jewelers. Hi, Dale here from Jungle Plant. I thought it was time for you all to hear about the great interior plant service we provide. This is Jane from Epic Wines. We are a distributor and importer of wines from around the world and the proud owners of our own award-winning brand, Butterfield Station. Jungle Plant brought some great plants to our new office. They answered our phone call promptly and gave us great service and were easy to work with. So give us a call at 462-5806 or visit us at jungleplant.com. This Sunday on Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, as summer heats up, we're headed to the Stone Fruit Jubilee with Santa Cruz County's Eco Farm and organic growers from the Central Valley. Also, one of the world's few master sommeliers joins us from his new restaurant with tips on tasting. Get the latest food, beverage, and travel news Sunday mornings 8 to 10, live right here on KSCO AM 1080. Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, your lifestyle information source. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Mr. Floyd Abrams. And before the break, you were making the point that uh, what might have seemed a little paranoid a few months ago is beginning to look a little more reasonable as we get uh, more and more news about government improprieties. Now, now I can't let you go without asking you uh, about the Citizens United ruling, um, one which we've had Russ Feingold and other leaders speak about on our program. And, and this continues to be a very controversial ruling because it, it formally extended the right to free speech from individuals to entities such as unions and corporations. Um, but more importantly, many people feel like it treats money in the form of campaign contributions as free speech. So is that a mischaracterization? Or, uh, and can you straighten that out for us? Yeah. Um, look, my view is that the uh, Citizens United case has to be understood first by thinking of, of the facts of the case, uh, Citizens United itself. There's an organization that yes. made a documentary that was critical of Hillary Clinton when she was the likely Democratic candidate in 2008. It would have been a crime under the laws that then exist to show it on television. Uh, the, the, the documentary was in part prepared uh, with some corporate money. Uh, my view was and is uh, that can't be squared with the First Amendment, that, that, that somebody wants to engage, something, somebody wants to engage in political speech about who to vote for. Uh, I just can't see how it's not protected. Now, on the corporate side, all I'd say is that uh, on a personal level, I spent most of my career representing corporations that engage in speech. And that no one would would claim uh, didn't uh, have uh, big time protection under the First Amendment. I mean, uh, you know, the New York Times, NBC, uh, CNN, uh, uh, all the large institutions that engage in speech of one sort or another are, as a general matter, in corporate forms. It just can't be the case that because it's a corporation that that the speech is not protected. I do think that, that people are on to something. I mean, they, they are reflecting a shared sense that, you know, maybe too few people with too much money have too much power in America. But But whatever you think of that, my answer is we don't solve that or even address it by addressing speech. If, if, if you're in favor of what, more taxes on large corporations or bigger anti, more antitrust uh, enforcement uh, or not having corporations, I mean, the First Amendment doesn't require having corporations, but the First Amendment requires is that whether it's a corporation or a partnership or a union or a, a single person with a, with a pamphlet, that that speech be protected. I mean, in the end of the day, the First Amendment doesn't protect speakers as defined in different categories. It protects speech. Uh, and, and when the speech is the sort of speech that we protect as a, uh, as a rule, that, in my view, shouldn't change 
It's just the speaker is a corporation. Uh, but when we look at that, uh, the First Amendment, it's it, there is one large condition that's placed on it, and that is the greater good. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you can't yell fire, and you can't yell fire because that's not in the interest of the greater good. It creates victims. And and so there are there are limitations on everything in the Constitution and every right that we're given. There, there just has to be some limit to it. We can't take it to the extreme. No, no, that's true. But, but I really don't think that that we should think of uh, the First Amendment or the Constitution as, as limited by what, who, the Supreme Court, the, the Congress, the President, the public generally, thinks is the greater good. We have the Bill of Rights, after all, as a protection against the government and, in a sense, against the majority of the people yes. who often, you know, want to prevent this or that from being said because it's so outrageous or it might do some harm or this or that. And now, it's true that the First Amendment isn't absolute. And, and, and Justice Holmes is talking about falsely crying fire in a public theater. Sure. is one example. The national security area that, that you and I were just talking about. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, nobody would maintain that, that there's an absolute right to, to reveal every national secret no matter how much harm it'll do. Yes. Uh, uh, so, so, so yes, there, there, are, there are limits, but, but not sort of big, broad. We won't let them speak, or, or, or you know, these pe- these people have too much power, or, or are, are controlling too much. What's, what's, what's going on? I mean, I, the First Amendment, at the end of the day, and the Bill of Rights, is a protection against the government. Uh, and that's why it's there. I mean, Jefferson wouldn't support the Constitution without a Bill of Rights. And when, and when Alexander Hamilton said, whoever said we could restrain the press, well, why do we need to say we can't when no one said we could? And Jefferson's answer was, we need a Bill of Rights because we need that protection against every government. Uh, and the And the number one protection against every government is a functioning First Amendment. Absolutely. Well, the truth of the matter is on the on the First Amendment, there is no authority greater than you that I, I think I'll be talking to. Uh, and I when when you say to me, well, listen, if corporations are getting becoming too powerful in the electro, uh, election process, uh, then curbing free speech is not the real remedy for that. There are other remedies, but we're we're basically it's the wrong prescription. And uh, and I understand that, but. As corporations uh, use more of their uh, power and their money in Washington, D.C., um, they're capable of supporting candidates that would uh, allow for, um, what do I want to say, legislation that would not be favorable to the workers, not even the union employees. So we have a tough situation here where they may be able to put in candidates who don't represent the interests of the employees and the union members. Uh, how do we fix that? Well, one way we do it is by making sure we have a really unrestrained press and an unrestrained Internet so people can comment on it, teach people, mm-hmm. educate them, at least offer opposing views. Um, another is that there are usually ways without restraining speech to to uh, assure that at least there are some competing views in the marketplace. I mean, here in New York City, where I'm speaking from now, we we have a, a system of funding, uh, which doesn't uh, for for a city election, say, which doesn't cut back on, on anyone's right to to spend. We have a mayor that spent 170 million dollars to, to get elected in his last campaign, mm-hmm. but the other candidate at least got 15 or 20 million dollars to run with, and and you know that's enough at least to get a message out. Uh, I, I think it should also be, be said that, that uh, you know, the last campaign, the last presidential campaign, certainly, you know, was one in, in which it was not shown that, you know, more money for one side or the other or for, or for this or for that necessarily carries the day. I mean, it, that's right. Well, I have a lot of friends that say if that were the case, Steve Forbes would be president. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I mean, really, the public, right. uh, I'm not pandering when I say this. I mean, the public really isn't dumb. They, 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 they can, that they know what they want. I may not agree with them all the time <laughs> on what they want, but but they can they can distinguish between candidates, and and it's not that money doesn't matter. It it it, it sure does, but but then it matters, you know, in everything. Uh, but but it 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 is not as if. You know, we sort of wiped out uh, the the rights of people to, uh, either to have views or to express them or to persuade other people. Yeah, well, critical mass always makes up for money. That's what I think. And so we're in violent agreement there. That's all the time we have left. But before we say goodbye, I do want to take a moment to thank you for your service to our country and for taking time to speak with us today. Thank you, Mr. Abrams. Thank you so much. I love your show. Bye-bye. As you know, former Secretary of Transportation, uh, it, who was responsible for the TSA, Norman Mineta, was scheduled to join us next week. But unfortunately, Mr. Mineta had to reschedule for a later date. And my producers have just been walking in here and saying that they are promising me that we're going to announce a very exciting guest for next week's program on our website. So until then, they're keeping it a big secret for me. <laughs> so I guess I'm going to be logging on to my own website just to find out uh, who they have in store for us. But be sure to join us again next week as we continue to fight to separate fact from fiction and principles from partisan propaganda. And if your station is leaving us after this first hour and you'd like to comment on today's program, uh, please take a moment to email me at RebeccaCosta.com or you can contact me on Facebook and Twitter. And if you haven't visited our newly overhauled YouTube channel, I hope you'll take a moment to check out the new videos and audio blogs. And, and you can also download previous episodes of the Costa Report there. Now stay tuned for the second hour of the Costa Report when we hear what you have to say. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. The original Stagnero family has been in business since 1879. The Stagnero name stands for quality, quantity, and great service. The family's Gilda's Restaurant on the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf is still the fishing headquarters of the Santa Cruz area. It's where fishermen gather each morning for coffee and breakfast before heading out on the bay. Stop by Gilda's and say hi. Dino looks forward to meeting you at Gilda's on the center of the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf. We voted for a government that would protect us, but voted in a government that gave us the Monsanto Protection Act. And now we eat food saturated in herbicides and infused with pesticides. Join me, Michael Olson, Saturday 9 a.m. on the Food Chain Radio Show for a discussion about how our government barred its federal courts from preventing Monsanto's GMOs. It's you and me talking about what's to eat in the Monsanto Protection Act. Saturday 9 a.m. on the Food Chain. Listen. And be heard. What day was that? From San Jose to Salinas. Red Hot News Talk. AM 1080 KSCO Santa Cruz.